Now, as I'm reading what you're saying about uh, your experiences in Rwanda, for mm. example, and you're also working in the Congo and other parts, but um, as I'm reading about the conditions in the prisons in Rwanda, right now, it seems that I'm, I've opened up Dante's Inferno and reading a description of hell. Uh, Pierre, it must break your heart. In fact, wh why not just describe for our viewers what a typical prison in Rwanda is like? What, what, what conditions are prisoners living in there? Well, some prisons are better than others, but you're right. It's hell on earth for many of them. Uh, very little food, no access to medication. Uh, if families or churches don't bring food, some will starve to death. Uh, we, we bring a few bottles of aspirins and they go crazy, you know, like there's nothing. There is nothing. But also, like both in Rwanda and, and especially like we've worked also in Goma, mm. you know. And, and the prison that was built for 150 prisoners has 700. Can you imagine the overcrowdedness? So they're confronted with incredible problems. You see, prisoners are always at the bottom of the rung. It's very simple in any country. And you can understand because they've heard community. And so, so imagine that if you have a poor country, if you have a country that is trying to, you know, to even feed its citizen, well, imagine the condition. But at the same time, it's in places like this, eh? It's in places like this that the good news of a biblical restorative justice can take hold. Okay, now, um, just before we get into mm -hmm. what the biblical view of restorative justice is, uh, an image that just jumped out at me was uh, the condition in one of the prisons that you were in for women. Yes. Uh, where in one room they were packed uh, like in uh. three levels, uh, no space really on the floor, no access to sanitary um, facilities whatsoever, uh. no privacy, yeah. um, and, and just kind of jammed into this cement block uh, room. Uh, what do you, what do you, what do you, how do you handle that? It breaks your heart, you know, like my, my wife, Judy, is, is driving, a, running a drive right now, like to collect, like, you know, underwears, like mm. to be able to bring, we're leaving on October the 18th. In the prison of Goma, like, I don't know if you follow, in June, eh, some prisoners tried to escape, it did not succeed. They broke down the wall, like, you know, leading to the women's mm. section, mm. Which, which had no windows, like, you know, the, yeah. the kind of description you're yeah. giving. They raped 23 women, okay? There were 23 women were trying now uh, through Simeon to, to try to bring some healing there. 19 of the 23 husbands, you know, sent a message to their wife, we don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. Okay? So Simeon is going to go and try to see those husbands and say, wake up. They've been raped, you know. Like when we're looking at the thing you know, about domestic violence, that area has been declared by the United Nations around Goma as the most dangerous for women and children. So the, the conditions for women in prison is just awful for men. And this is where we're trying to make an impact, trying to be of encouragement to some men and women that have the courage to go and try to listen to prisoners. And, and many of these prisoners, of course, are there uh, with no charges. And, and uh, they're, 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 they have no access to lawyers. That's it. Uh, they're being held there for no um, just reason at all. Some, some of them are, are, are awaiting trial for months and some of them for years. Now, in the prisons of Rwanda, a lot of them are there because of the genocide. They're genocide perpetrators. Yeah. And a lot of them are serving long sentences. And some are still waiting like, to be sentenced, but most of them that we are working, we were involved in an incredible project in the Giseni prison, which is just near Goma, uh, where one of the chaplains we had trained, you know, we said to the chaplain, there's more to a prison chaplain than preaching. Right. You know, yeah. you, you've got to go and listen to them. So he went back and told the warden, said, I've taken that course. They told me I should listen more to prison and not just preach to them. Well, the warden said, I don't pay you if you want to come, you know, five days a week, well, come. So every time he had a chance, he went in and started listening to the prisoners. But to his surprise, after four months, Jim, 400, 400 prisoners came to him with a letter of apology they had written to their victim asking forgiveness. He said, what do I do? So he turned to us and we went there and we developed a special training 
for victim offender encounters, telling the prisoner, you know, hey, it's one thing to write the letter. Like maybe the victim doesn't want to see that letter, you know? And so trying to help them understand some of the dynamics, the, the heart of all toward forgiveness, but also going to see the victim. And you cannot put the letter in the mail. One story, you know? We sent a traveler, he went up in the mountain and, and, and he was walking and he got to a crossroad. All he had was a name, Solange, you know, with a long name. And then a woman came, he said, I'm looking for Solange. She said, it's me. He said, it's you. <laughs> he couldn't believe it, you know. And he said, I have a letter here from a prisoner asking you for forgiveness. Do you want to see that letter? Well, she said, God must have sent you. Because I just came back from getting a teaching from a catechist on the importance of forgiveness. So she said, yeah, I'd like to see the letter. So she took the letter, she read it, and she said, not only, you know, am I glad to read the letter, she said, I'm willing to go and meet with him. Well, Jim, I wish you had been there. A few weeks later, she came down to Gisenyi. We received her in the home that we had, you know, rented for that purpose, trying to prepare her for the meeting. And then the next day we met. We had a very little room, you know, like uh, you, you get the picture because you've been there. 